Quantum Machine Learning, or QML, is one of the three major application categories for quantum computing, along with optimization and simulation. As we're working with customers to find advantageous use cases in QML, we rely daily on a tool called Penny Lane from Xanadu. Find out more about this powerful, free software in this episode of the Post-Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Kragianis. I lead Quantum Computing Services at Prativity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. Our guest today is the head of software at Xanadu. That's the company behind Penny Lane, which is a tool we use regularly here. So Nathan Killerin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So glad to be here. And as I said, we actually use Penny Lane in our quantum computing services projects. Uh, so I thought it would be fun to bring my quantum lieutenant into this chat. Uh, she's a senior consultant at Prativity that puts algorithms to qubits, so to speak. So Emily Stam, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. So uh, Nathan, tell us a little bit about Xanadu. Yeah, Xanadu is a Canadian quantum computing company. We're about five years old now. We have uh, software and hardware. So, you know, what someone might call a, a full stack play, but I, I don't really like to think of it that way. I like to think that we kind of touch all the key parts of quantum computing, but they don't necessarily have to live all in one single monolithic stack. I like more thinking that we build on the software side, we build on the hardware side, and we build also on the education and community side. Yeah, that's great. And uh, one day I'd love to have someone come on just to dive into the photonic approach that Xanadu's taking with hardware. Um, that would be a whole great episode. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. But I guess, it's really interesting technology. Yeah, definitely. And, and today, obviously, we have you here uh, in your role as head of software. So you want to tell us a little bit about that role? Absolutely. So I've been the head of software at Xanadu for just over four years now, leading a really amazing team, uh, really just trendsetters in the field, I would say. It's, it's, our, it's our secret here. And when I, when I think of software, I think of basically in quantum computing, everything between the hardware and the user. So you might think of software as sometimes just like code or it's an app or something. But I think of the whole pipeline from something that touches hardware down to something that touches your keyboard or even something that touches your, your brain. So, you know, what does the cloud platform look like that hosts that hardware? What does the local software look like that's uh, installed on your, on your computer? What are the algorithms that you're running there on your computer? How do you know what to do there? How does the software know what to do to best use the hardware? And then, you know, on the community side, how do people actually know what to run on a quantum computer? How do they know what to do when we give them the software? So I think that is a very holistic uh, whole pipeline of things that we should uh, be stewards of. And we're going to drill into a lot of that, um, but first we're just going to take a little step back. And can you give a high level of the difference between Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields? And um, I have to say, I promised my legal department that I wouldn't even hum during this interview, so I'm not going to for either of those names. But you can, <laughs> if you want to kind yeah. of separate them. <laughs> we don't want the copyright strikes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So uh, obviously, uh, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields both named after Beatles songs. I think it was actually Strawberry Fields Forever. I think they actually came from the same the single. Like one was the A side, one was the B side, if I remember correctly. And they cover two different needs for us here. So one is the Strawberry Fields software. Strawberry Fields was our very first offering. And for that, we were, we were thinking, we're building a photonic quantum computer. People need to be able to access it, right? There was no tool in, what was this, twenty. 2017, I think we, we started building that. There was no tool in 2017 for accessing cloud-deployed photonic quantum computers. And we couldn't really count on anyone else to build that on our behalf, so we had to build it. So Starbright Fields, you can think of as the API for accessing Xanadu's photonic quantum computing hardware. So anything that we put on the cloud is photonic, very likely you can hit it up using Strawberry Fields. And then Penny Lane is much more uh, of an ag agnostic software, I would say. So the way I like to think about Penny Lane is, imagine if Xanadu wasn't a hardware company. What if we didn't have our, our own hardware at all? And as head of software, you know, there's actually very little that I can do to influence the hardware. So if I'm running a team and we're going to build products, what do we build them around? What are the ideas that we use? And I just said, let's take our best ideas, the things that we think are most impactful. Let's make a software around that and let's make it connect to every quantum computer. 
And so we really focused in the first uh, days of Penny Lane on quantum machine learning. It was an area that we thought was very up and coming, which proved to be a, a very accurate prediction. Uh, we had a lot of expertise on the team. And in those days, there weren't very many people who knew about QML. So we, we kind of knew what the community might need. We could anticipate that because we were, let's say, the first users ourselves. And then we said, let's make sure this tool can connect to any quantum computer out there. If we were a quantum software startup, we wouldn't partner with just one hardware provider. We would say, bring your own devices, whatever API keys you have access to. We'll make sure that you can run uh, the same code on all those different devices. Yeah, and, and we definitely found that to be um, one of the most alluring aspects. And as Constantinos mentioned, we use Penny Lane here at Protivity. And the first use case we had for Penny Lane was binary classification. So what types of machine learning use cases has your team worked on with Penny Lane? Great question. I would say in the early days, we were a bit more exploratory. It was a very developing field, and it wasn't really clear uh, Know, what are the best use cases for using a quantum computer for machine learning? Uh, so we, we did a lot of, I would say, more or less uh, curiosity-driven uh, research in those early days just to try and get a sense of the field and what were the, the key lessons we could learn. Right now, I would say our biggest focus is actually on not a particular specific kind of use case, but on the foundations of the field. What are the what are the ideas that we think are the most impactful things that if we provide to people those tools, those algorithms, then they're going to go out and they're going to do research. They're going to come up with ideas that we never could have thought of. They're going to apply it to use cases that we never thought about it. And then it's going to come back and benefit us and benefit the whole field because now all these new ideas came out without us having to really uh, invest the resources into, into all these possible different ways to to uh, to tackle something. So I would say really our focus these days, uh, we do do some research for sure, but on the QML side, the, the focus is really on the foundations. How do we build up a field that didn't exist five years ago into one that uh, in a few short years is running at large scale with very interesting and powerful algorithms doing really interesting stuff on novel data sets. So I think the idea there was kind of giving up on a single use case and focusing on the foundations. Yeah, and you could see some of that foundational work and educational outreach. I, I mean, both applications have a lot of tutorials, demonstrations, resources. Um, so you want to talk a little bit more about what you're trying to do there in that other role, like you mentioned, with the educational aspects of Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields? Absolutely. I guess I guess the guiding principle is it doesn't, doesn't matter how cool your product is or your software is if no one knows about it or no one knows how to use it. So... There's obviously an ulterior motive to putting these things out because it, it helps us to advertise our work. We, we try not to put any strings attached to it. We try to offer the content for free and based on interest and based on what we think is most uh, impactful for the community. We don't you know, force you to necessarily install everything. You can just read everything in your browser. So the focus is really on openness and putting that stuff out there. But it has a nice benefit that it, you know, if, when people are learning about quantum computing, they're learning about it and Penny Lane is right there, or Strawberry Fields is right there. So I would say that's that's more of the uh, strategic side of things. But it, it's always been, a, a since day one, for us, a huge part of what we do. It started with just having a sense of like community building is important. For a startup in particular, you, you need to build a user base, you need to build an audience, you need to build that community for your survival. And so... We, we, you know, it's, it's part of a survival thing. How are we going to differentiate ourselves from the big players? Well, we do have some expertise that we think, you know, the big players could match, but they're not focused on it. Or maybe we've just got some really, really amazing, unique, uh, once in a lifetime kind of team members who are leaders in the field. Let's really leverage that expertise. And my philosophy is give more than you have to. So instead of saying, we're just going to focus, we're going to shut out the rest of the world, we're going to focus on building a quantum computer and building the best software and building the best algorithms. Let's actually open up, be friendly, be, be open to people and be, and be willing to invite them along for the ride. Uh, it doesn't mean we, we have to spend all of our time teaching people. It means that we can offer our, our learnings and our educational resources in a scalable way so that more and more people can discover it. And the field moves so quickly that's you know, there's that huge appetite for content. There's a huge appetite to understand things that are, unless you're a researcher, you're reading the literature, you're not going to be able to keep up with. So we try to translate what we're seeing as trends 
uh, important things in the field and put it more accessible to people as well. Who's developing all that material educational side? Are they Xanadu developers? Are they like independent contributors? How does that work? Well, we welcome contributions from everyone. As I said, a, a huge focus on community and part of the aspect of community is inviting other people to take part. So not mm -hmm. having it be too one-sided. So we do actually have on the Penny Lane website, anyone can submit a tutorial and be listed on our community page. But there are a number of more polished tutorials and demonstrations that we host on our, our websites. And those more polished ones, um, sometimes they're coming from external partners, but a lot of the time they're coming from the internal team here. So the software developers of Penny Lane or the researchers at Xanadu are the ones who are translating their knowledge. You know, they might have just uh, finished writing a paper and they, they make it more accessible by putting a tutorial up at the same time, or they might have had a huge new feature that they added that unlocks some new powers and they want to make sure that other people understand how to use it. So I would say the, the contributions are coming from everywhere and the, the more polished ones are definitely, uh, we put a lot of effort into those. So the target audience of these is, is pretty much anyone, right? Someone really, really new to this, someone who's doing it and wants to expand in their field, um, at a company that's trying to a new, a, use, a new use case or a new approach or something. So it's kind of diverse. It looks like there's a lot there. <laughs> Absolutely. So the great thing about the internet is you can put stuff out and people can find it. And we've, we've discovered that there's a huge... Uh, appetite for what I would call like the enthusiast community. These are people who for the first time are getting into quantum. They want to get up to speed. They're smart people, but they haven't had that background. They want to, they want to learn about it. They want to know what's going on in the latest trends. And so there's huge, huge appetite from that community. And of course, there's the more established researchers, you know, the old guard, the people who are professors or grad students. And even for them, you know, sometimes they appreciate having the more accessible content rather than having to dive deep into a paper and try to figure it out for themselves. Yeah, and it's great to keep that spirit of sharing going as long as we can, because eventually I have this fear that the, the whole industry is going to lock down with IP concerns and, and no one's going to share anything anymore. Um, it could happen. It could happen. I think uh, the way I like to think about it is right now everyone is a friendly competitor, and I hope it stays that way for as long as we can. Yeah, yeah same here. And not to get too technical, but a differentiator of Penny Lane from other quantum libraries is the use of the decorator. So I was wondering what inspired the Xanadun team to choose this approach, and is this a question you receive a lot? Actually, it's, it's the first time we've received a question about why we, we use decorators, so <laughs> congrats. Um, we, we definitely get questions about uh, the interface and how it came about, the user interface, and it was a very, very deliberate uh, consideration. So especially when we created Penny Lane, the competitor software the other libraries that were available to people are very much focused on object-oriented programming. So the user uh, kind of just creates these big monolithic objects and uh, manipulates them. And we decided to take a different approach. Uh, Penny Lane was initially focused very heavily on quantum machine learning. And in modern machine learning libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so forth, the interface has evolved to a state where it's very much based on functions rather than classes. So a function is something that, you know, you can have a mathematical representation. It takes an input and gives you an output, uh, but you can also code up functions in code. So you call a function to, to do some data processing for you or to evaluate uh, the output given some inputs. And functional programming is quite different than object-oriented programming. I mean, to, to give away a little bit of a secret here, a lot of what we use are actually what I would call a, functional classes. So there are things that are both classes and functions, but the UI that we present is very much based on functions. So you have a quantum circuit, and instead of uh, creating some quantum circuit object and appending gates to it, you actually just create a function that lists line by line all the gates in your circuit, and that gets called. Uh, and you can think of it as somehow being sent off to a quantum computer to evaluate. Now, the, the question was actually about decorators. Why did we end up with decorators? Well, once we decided to go with a functional approach, Python has this very nice uh, way of hiding away the complexity of manipulating functions. So if you want to get really deep in the details, um, you know, when you have functions, you can start talking about higher order functions, which are functions which take, which take functions as input and give functions as output. And it starts becoming a bit uh, more of a cognitive load to carry all that around in your head. So Python provides this very nice, lightweight decorator approach, which just says, give me a function, and then it's just a single line 
to modify this function to do something. And the, the user never has to worry about that, that extra burden of thinking about how it, how it is to manipulate functions. So there's a lot of magic happening under the hood when you, when you decorate a function. It's basically allowing us to abstract away all the complexity and give the users what they want to do without having to think about how it's done. That's, that makes a lot of sense. And have you seen any benefits using this approach? I mean, I think the benefit is just simplicity. It allows the user to focus purely on the, the quantum circuit that they are working on and not worrying about how to um, you know, manage the job of submitting it to hardware. We can kind of hide that all the way with just a function call. As you alluded to earlier, uh, one of the great things about Penny Lane is it was obviously built not just for your hardware. Um, you know, there's plugins, so you can run code on um, many platforms, devices, Kiskit, Bracket. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about the plugins and how they work? For sure, for sure. So the, the philosophy here is essentially be as agnostic to the actual computational backend as much as possible. Obviously, there's some slight differences in quantum computing hardware. They support different gates. They might have slightly different uh, requirements. But really, what we want people to do when they're writing software is to think about the, the algorithm. You know, what goal do you want to achieve? And not too much thinking about the details of execution. So if you can get to the point where you swap out one quantum computer for the other and you, you know, notice no, no changes, that's kind of the ideal there. And it's also not clear... You know, Xanadu is a hardware company. There's lots of other competitors in the hardware space. Nobody has won hardware right now, and there's still a lot of work to do before it's it's clear what the, the potential winners might be there. So it makes a lot of sense to allow users to to bring their own device to to kind of you know go where the users are. If they like a particular platform, well, why would I stop them from using my software, our team software, if they they happen to use a, a hardware that uh, we weren't expecting? So we try to make it that all the main quantum computing platforms are supported and it's it's actually simple to add your own. So in, actually a number of uh, plugins have been built by, by users. And in fact, the Qiskit plugin was initially built by a user because they wanted to run Penny Lane on, on Qiskit devices. And we've since taken over adoption. But it, it just goes to show, you know, sometimes if you make it such that uh, you don't have to think too much about which hardware you're running on, uh, then it actually allows people to very easily transfer to new hardware. It's not baked into the code anywhere. That's definitely one of the main advantages of Penny Lane for sure. Um, I was wondering what challenges, or if, if any, have you encountered adding these external libraries? I would say there's maybe two challenges. So the first challenge is just every, every line of code that you add to your code base uh, is something that you have to test, you have to document. So having a dozen uh, plugins is now something we have to test and make sure everything is, is up to date. And sometimes it can slip through. Sometimes we can maybe miss uh, a plugin has been updated. There's a breaking change in Qiskit or Microsoft's QDK or something. And we, we haven't quite uh, noticed it until a user uh, tells us about their use case failing. So that's one of the challenges is that as we scale, um, especially our, our own in-house tutorials, uh, they sometimes break and we have to update them if the partner's plugin uh, that say Kiskit or something has breaking changes. Mm -hmm. So it just becomes more complex internally, but I think it's worth it. I think, again, we're, we're focusing on providing value to the users and it's something we know how to do. And they seem to be quite keen to use different devices so we can continue to support that. The other one I would say is encouraging third parties to create plugins for their own hardware. There's a, there's a couple uh, platforms where we've actually done a lot of the legwork uh, in creating those plugins. And the partner will just provide us with an API key to make sure we can test it. But we've done a lot of the work. So it'd be great to have more, more partners uh, actually developing the plugins themselves rather than, than through us. And there's been a couple uh, out there that have already done that, most notably Amazon Bracket. And are there any plugins in the works you can talk about? Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think that there's any that I, are coming out anytime soon. There will be when there's a new machine that surprises us all, right? <laughs> exactly. If, if there's a new machine that surprises us all, uh, and we've done it a couple of times, like drop everything you're doing that we can make sure that as soon as possible we can connect to it. Yeah, start rolling up. Um, so in addition to Penny Lane, um, using it for developing proof of concept for a customer, uh, we have a new offering we're working on where we're going to be using it to demonstrate the code that we create and then we'll be leaving that code behind with the customer. Um, so 
I imagine that we're going to be then enticing these customers, right? They're going to be seeing Penny Lane. They're going to be seeing its power and they'll probably want to start using it in their environments. Um, so do you have any thoughts about deploying Penny Lane in corporate like managed environments? Uh, you know, so some customers don't like to just hand things out without it having some kind of control over it, right? For sure. Maybe I just start by saying it's it's just super cool as someone who's been working on this for a few years to see more and more companies adopting Penny Lane and building products on top of it. I think there's been a, a very nice shift in the last year or, or so where I'm seeing more and more companies building on top of that, and I think it's it's you know it's it's really amazing to see, and it also gives us some uh, some validation that what we're doing is is definitely popular. And the other thing is that. Um, we always are very careful not to have too many breaking changes in the code base. Some some other libraries in quantum computing, because it's such a, a hot field, it's developing very quickly. The ideas are not set in stone. There might be a lot of breaking changes every release. And for us, we have a very regressive release cycle, uh, about eight releases a year. And we're careful to try to limit breaking changes as much as possible. It's not always possible to, to stop uh, breaking things. Sometimes the ideas you had in the past just don't work anymore. There's a much better way to do it. But we try to be very, you know, very mindful that we're not just doing it for ourselves. We're releasing new versions and users are using them and they should expect some sort of consistency or at least a roadmap for deprecating things. So that's really cool to, to see uh, lots of companies adopting it. And it puts more, more onus on us to make sure that we're really keeping it as consistent as possible, even, even in a very hot space. Sometimes you actually find that people, uh, when you talk to them, are they're, they're kind of hacking the, the internals at Penny Lane for their use cases. And that's cool to see because it means that there's more and more demand for doing interesting things. And we'd love to talk to, to partners and see if we can kind of make, make those hacks more you know, real features. But in, in Python in particular, there's, no, there's no, no notion of like private versus public code. Everything is completely public. And so... The way to distinguish code that is like meant to be for the users and code that's meant to be for developers is just by convention, essentially. Like you put some underscore in front of it. And it's very easy for a developer who wants something to just, you know, if they've got a use case and they just they can look at the code, they can look at the source and say, this is the function I need to change a little bit of. You know, sometimes those are meant to be like private functions where we have no guarantees about uh, stability and people will start using those. So it's a really interesting problem. You have to be very careful to sunset code, not make too many breaking changes. And I think you know, your question was about deploying things in, a, in corporate environments. I don't know too much about the security aspect of things and the controlling things, but I think keeping things stable is also something that's very important to, to customers who are building code on top of things. Yeah, and I'm sure some teams are concerned about um, API keys and things like that. Um, you know, access to backend targets, shots can add up really quickly when you're running them on quantum computers and costs <laughs> can skyrocket. So I didn't know if there was any thought given to any kind of like controls put in place for that in the future or anything like that in the roadmap. Well, right now, everything is done. Uh, there's different ways, actually, you could, uh, where you could put your API key, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can have a configuration file where it's just read from disk. And, and actually, we run a lot of tests on, on GitHub that are pulling keys out from like a secure location. So the functionality is definitely there. Uh, I think it takes a bit of maybe talking to the right people and getting a sense of what their key desires are and, and making sure that they're happy with what we're building. But I, I don't see any, any uh, blockers to be able to implement that kind of feature. Okay. A crucial interest with quantum computing is accessibility. How does PennyLink contribute to the accessibility of quantum computing and how can we make it more accessible? For sure. Um, you know, our, our goal is always to make quantum computing more accessible in a couple ways. So one, give people free tools. So you want to get into quantum computing, hey, you can start right now. It just requires a, a laptop and an internet connection. You can download the library and get started. So putting the tools in people's hands the other thing is giving them a sense of what to do with those tools. So if I give you the tool, but you have no idea how to use it, then I wouldn't say that's very accessible. So giving people the tools, but also like the instruction manual or the, the tutorial videos, or all, the, all the supporting pieces that allow you to not only 
have it in your hands, but actually to, to do something with it. So you know, I think that really speaks to accessibility. And then the third thing is you don't want to work in isolation, right? Accessibility means being able to find someone who can answer your questions or find like-minded people who you want to work on a project with. And so that's where our community building side comes from. We try to not only just put out the educational resources, but give people opportunities for congregating people who have, have like minds to, to get together, to work together. And so one of the ways we've done this, we just had this uh, event, QHack. It's our big kind of developer conference for Penny Lane. It's very, very open. It's very um, you know, welcoming. It's, it's a great way to get introduced to the field and to meet others. So we actually had it about 65 teams who were working on hackathon projects. And I think some of these teams were not necessarily people all living in the same city or going to the same university, but they actually found each other through the, the Penny Lane community or the quantum computing community. Yes. And I attended QHack. That was a great co conference. Um, <laughs> Glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, it was terrific. And I do think Penny Lane makes quantum computing very accessible. And definitely the fact that it's free also lowers that barrier, which a lot of people face getting into quantum computing. So uh, I'm glad that accessibility is something that Xanadu is thinking about. Absolutely. It's one of our biggest priorities. Yeah. And it's funny, um, free, you know, it, it's a free product, but we're still using it, even though we have access to a lot of others. <laughs> so it, it's just kind of like that really obvious sort of compliment when something works, why wouldn't you want to use it? Um, and, and what they Actually, I, I, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, maybe this is my opportunity to turn the, turn the tables on you. What, sure. what do you guys use uh, Penny Lane for? Mostly just different quantum machine learning use cases, especially in finance. We've been working on one using the quantum support vector machine, um, another using variational quantum classifiers. So those were both for that binary classification use case I mentioned earlier, but also exploring it for a lot of other quantum machine learning use cases as well. Yeah, and um, that's why I wanted to ask you about your uh, recent paper, Is Quantum Advantage the Right Goal for Quantum Machine Learning? So what are some of the more meaningful questions to ask and, and why is this approach you know, beneficial? Yeah, so this is a recent paper by, by Maria Schold and myself. And you know, even the title, actually, I think went through a few iterations and we, we ended up with Is Quantum Advantage the Right Goal for Quantum Machine Learning? Something like that. Because we really wanted to, you know, force the question. Um, the, way, the way we kind of see it, I think it's amazing that we have a, a big uh, ecosystem in quantum computing and all ideas are on the table. I think it's, it's you know, we don't want to have people gatekeeping or people saying, you know, don't look into that. I think at this early stage of the technology, it's really important to keep all ideas on the table and let, you know, let them simmer, let them see people with passion could maybe push ideas that we weren't expecting and they'll be successful. So I never want to tell people what you should work on and what you shouldn't work on. But of course, we, we did write a, a, you know, a paper with a very pro provocative title. So obviously, we have our own thoughts about this. And the way, the way we see it is that there's maybe a bit overemphasis on trying to prove quantum advantage for quantum machine learning. I think it's important, but maybe there's too many resources being devoted toward that compared to other areas where we could potentially be putting our, our time and energy. So let's see. So quantum computing and quantum machine learning, they're, they're like a you know, classic moonshot. This is a technology that you anticipate is going to change the world. And it's a huge uh, undertaking technologically to get there, scientific challenges to overcome. But, you know, if you're going to the moon, you don't look up the moon and say, okay, I'll just, I'll just jump higher and higher and higher, right? Because you're not going to get there. So that's kind of why I see quantum advantage. Uh, some of the papers that we see, some of the works we see is people looking at the moon and saying, well, I know how to jump. So I'll just try to see if I can push jumping as high as I can get. And you know, that's like saying, I know how to do something today uh, with a classical computer. I'm going to try it with quantum and try to see if I can prove advantage there. But really, you don't get to the moon by jumping higher and higher. You have to, at some point, you know, learn about the physical world and propulsion and learn to build rockets and engineering and train your astronauts. There's all these really important, really interesting steps along the way that you, you'll need to put the energy into if you want to get to that final state. So we're just, we're proposing people put more and more energy into those kind of foundational steps, those key building blocks, those key tools that we're going to leverage to get to that goal of quantum advantage. I think we all believe 
that they will be able to show some quantum advantage for quantum machine learning. It's already known for general quantum computing how to show quantum advantage. And there's some really interesting papers the last couple of years about the QML case. I think generally the consensus is that, you know, that's not a mirage. So if that's not a mirage, then let's get started on the building those rocket ships so we can get there. That's, that's I would say, a very uh, story-like way to, to summarize the, the position. Okay. And do you think that there's going to be um, still some developments that we haven't thought of that will get us there? You know, obviously, absolutely. Mach- yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Machines might become really, really powerful. And then, you know, the code might be really more efficient. But is there something else, some other synergy we're missing still? I, I think there's there's definitely going to be some, what I would call unknown unknowns, things that we don't know, we don't know, mm-hmm. uh, that we'll have to solve when we get there. Uh, so we don't know where they're going to be, and we don't know what the solution is. But at some point, we'll be faced with those questions, for sure. I also think that there's probably stuff that's known today. And a few people are probably recognizing, or maybe they're just, you know, they're fortunate to have been in the right area at the right time. They're they're recognizing that this is the way it has, it's going to have to go. We're going to have to solve this problem. We're going to have to push this idea in order to move the field forward. So I think... There's going to be questions like that along the whole way. There's some that are here today. We might even have answers now, but it's just not clear that they are the right answers because we haven't probed them enough. And that's a lot of what our focus is on at Xanadu, uh, the research side, is really trying to find, identify those key questions and try to solve them and use that to move the whole field together. Yeah. And, and with those optimistic words, um, you know, this is the decade of quantum. So you have until 2030 to figure it all out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> um, thanks well, a as lot. I said, it's, it's, it's a community <laughs> effort. So if, if yeah. we get there, it's because of the community. Yeah, I agree. Um, Nathan, thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you to you, Emily, for joining me in, as a co-host today. You're welcome. Now it's time for Coherence, the Quantum Executive Summary, where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. Xanadu is truly a full-stack quantum computing company. They're working on a photonic quantum system and also focusing on all the software layers involved in accessing and programming their machine, as well as systems from other manufacturers. In addition to creating the Penny Lane tool, Xanadu is focused on making learning about quantum coding more accessible. They have a community of users providing tutorials, in addition to staff helping create content. Penny Lane is a powerful tool for coders interested in quantum machine learning. Users can select from different backend devices and platforms. For example, you can run code on Amazon Bracket or Qiskit. As the library of plugins grows, The community of users helps provide real-time feedback to detect any issues that may appear. An excellent model for an excellent free piece of software that we use daily at Protivity. Xanadu is thinking about what it takes to take QML to the next level. There are still unknowns in the path to making this field advantageous to multiple use cases. I highly recommend you check out Nathan's co-authored paper, Is Quantum Advantage the Right Goal for Quantum Machine Learning? Which I've linked in the show notes. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Nathan Killerin for joining to discuss Penny Lane and Xanadu, and to Emily Stamm for being a special co-host. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Pertivity's The Post-Quantum World, and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker, that's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Protivity. You can also DM me suggestions or questions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, check out Pertivity.com or follow Pertivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. The future where the software may evaluate annealers or hybrid simulators. We've moved from quantum volume and algorithmic qubits to benchmarking, which is exciting. The next step would be identifying how well machines do at creating error-mitigated logical qubits. One day, we might also be able to have scores that reflect if machines are in a performance range known for quantum advantage. There are a lot of possibilities for the future here. 
That does it for this episode. Thanks to Pranav Gokhale and Fred Chong for joining to discuss Supermark. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Pertivity's The Post Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Pertivity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, check out Pertivity.com or follow Pertivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. Quantum Curious.